Colorado and at one point was also at NRL and uh, here in Washington. And so she's going to be talking to us about solar uh, irradiance. Uh, in other words, what, this, what the sun does to our atmosphere and a lot of interesting parts about that. Well, yep. it's, it's great to have you tonight, um, ma'am, and, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. My name's Judith Lane, and by way of introduction, I actually worked in George Josek's, Josek's branch for, I don't know, George, how many, 20 years? And I studied the sun, as did we all in George's branch. So tonight I'm going to talk about solar irradiance, which is basically the photons from the sun that um, are Earth's energy source. So it's the sun as a star. And if you look up with Wikipedia, which I just did to check, um, there's an entry called the solar constant, and it's still there. And the solar constant is actually the total solar irradiance at one astronomical unit, in other words, at a fixed distance. And it, it makes mention of, well, it's not really a sort of proper constant because it actually varies by a few tenths of a percent. Well, what I'm going to show you is those few tenths of a percent are actually really important for understanding the Earth and how it varies. So I'm going to start by showing you how the sun's radiation is the dominant source of energy for the Earth and how it literally establishes the Earth's environment as we know, it, including the surface temperature, the atmosphere and the ozone layer, and the space environment where satellites orbit. So clearly, if this irradiance varies, which it does, then that variability can impact all of these different environments. So I'm going to show you the irradiance observations that we've had from the space era prior to launching um, radiometers um, on satellites, it wasn't possible to measure um, the solar irradiance very variability because of the atmosphere interfering with the view of the sun. So we have 40 years of space measurements that show that the irradiance varies, but we really would like to have more um, longer term databases. So I'm going to show you how we, uh, with my colleague, Yiming Wang, we reconstruct past changes of the sun. And also, <laughs> very bravely, I'm going to show you some predictions for the future, just for the record. And then having established the variability of the sun and the irradiance, I'm going to show you how those um, changes affect um, our environment from the surface um, to space. So the sun, as you probably all know, being astronomers, is a black body, um, approximately radiates as a black body, about um, almost 6,000 Kelvin. The Earth is also actually a black body, but it's pretty cold, and both of them radiate to space. So this is an image showing the sun. The energy comes from the core, radiates out, and then is convected to the surface. Photons are the main source of energy radiating from the sun to the Earth's surface. The Earth reflects um, about 30% of those photons, but the sun heats the Earth, so it is a black body, albeit a cooler one, and it also radiates to space. Now, both of these bodies have atmospheres, and the atmospheres are hotter than the surface in both cases. So this is a picture of the sun's atmosphere, the corona, which I'm sure you all know, 100,000 Kelvin. The Earth's atmosphere is called the thermosphere, or in this case, the embedded ionosphere. And this is a picture of the Earth's ionosphere um, from the NRL camera, actually, on the moon. And you can see here as well that the temperature of the Earth's atmosphere increases, which is a direct result of the photons at extreme ultraviolet wa wavelengths coming from the sun. So these are the two bodies that I'm literally going to talk about, the interactions between them. The sun. The sun source of energy in terms of photons is approximately approximately 1362 watts per meter squared. It's the largest source of energy by far. It directly heats the surface and it directly heats the atmosphere and the stratosphere. There are other sources of energy as well, including solar wind, which interacts with the Earth via its magnetosphere, and that then interacts with the lower atmosphere. There are cosmic rays, but you can see I've put here the amount of energy in all of these sources, and by far the largest source of energy are the photons. In other words, the solar irradiance. Now, the balance of the incoming visible radiation, so the sun is a black body at about almost 6,000 K, which means that its peak emission is at visible wavelength. 
So this visible um, energy um, coming from the sun, and this schematic shows you here that it basically comes at the sub uh, sort of equatorial subsolar point. It heats the radiate, it heats the Earth's surface. The Earth's surface then is warmed and radiates to space. Now the difference between these two is that the incoming sunlight energy is sort of equatorial and at the surface of the Earth facing the sun. But the outgoing heat radiates from all parts of the Earth's surface. Now, of course, it's much more complicated than this. So this is the incoming sun. Part of it is absorbed and part of it is reflected by the atmosphere, by clouds, by the Earth's surface. Part of it is absorbed by the land and the ocean. When these objects are heated, they then radiate to space. So you can see the Earth's energy budget is really complicated in its own right. So even if the sun's energy didn't vary, this would be a very complicated uh, system to try and understand. And it's more complicated because the radiation uh, coming from the sun dominates at low latitudes, as I said, but the outgoing radiation is at all latitudes. And what happens is that there's a surplus of incoming solar radiation at low latitudes, and there's a deficit at high latitudes. So the atmosphere wants to move this surplus of energy to the poles. And that sets up what um, we know and what I'm sure you know as things like the circulation patterns in the atmosphere, including the pole. Oh, sorry. Can you see me still? I clicked something and it went funny. Oh, here we go. Okay. And so this, this um, sets up, for example, the, the tropical circulation cells where the heat rises and is convected down at mid latitudes. The polar vortex, you've probably heard about the, the polar vortex. When the polar vortex is wobbly, which it is when the, it, um, the balance between the incoming radiation at the, at the equator and at the poles, when, when that um, gradient decreases, the polar vortex uh, becomes more wobbly. And this affects um, whether um, here, in northern latitudes, for example. So just the basic energy distribution and dynamics of the Earth is determined by the sun. As we go higher in the atmosphere, now most of the radiation does penetrate to the Earth's surface, but the ultraviolet radiation at wavelengths less than about 300 nanometers is absorbed in the Earth's, surface, in the Earth's atmosphere. And what happens is that oxygen absorbs radiation our wavelength is less than about 280 nanometers. It dissociates, it produces ozone um, by the, the atomic and molecular oxygen recombining. The ozone absorbs ultraviolet radiation. It heats the atmosphere and produces the ozone layer. And as I'm sure you all know, the ozone layer is what protects us from the sun's ultraviolet radiation. So the sun, in a way, produces the atmosphere that protects it protects us from itself, from the sun, which is sort of really interesting. And so as you go up, um, there's an increase in temperature, partly because of the ozone absorption. Now that's the, the um, radiative part of things. But what happens here too, is that the there's a big dynamical circulation now from the hemisphere that, that heats the atmosphere called the Brewer-Dobson circulation, which sit, sits on top of the troposphere, the tropospheric circulation. So you can see as we go up in altitude, the, the dynamics of the Earth system is becoming more and more complicated. And that's certainly true when we go even higher into the thermosphere. The thermosphere is um, the region above about 100 kilometers, it extends up to about 1,000 kilometers. This is the region where satellites orbit, for example, the space station, uh, low Earth orbiting satellites. And you can see that while the density decreases, it's not negligible, and the temperature increases. And the reason the temperature increases is because now the sun's extreme ultraviolet and ultraviolet photons have enough energy to dissociate not only O2, but N2, and these um, gases literally absorb these, this radiation. And we have yet another circulation pattern. So you can see that the sun establishes the whole complex um, structure of the Earth. And thus, if the radiation varies, then that is going to be important. And I might mention that embedded in the thermosphere is the ionosphere. The ionosphere is the region of charged particles because the sun's um, short wavelength radiation can ionize 
the primary gases in the atmosphere. And the ionosphere, as you know, is um, that layer of um, charged particles that reflects radio waves, transmits radio waves, and in fact interferes with things like the global positioning system. When there's a, a big storm on the sun, it produces a lot of ionizing radiation in the form of photons and also particles that disrupts the ionosphere. So now, okay, does the sun's irradiance vary? Is it really the solar constant? No, and this figure shows you 40 years, more than 40 years of direct observations of the sun's total solar irradiance. And the observations here are in white. And you can see that the total solar irradiance has a really beautiful 11 year cycle, but that's not all. It has these big dips and, and this is not noisy data. These data are beautiful and very precise. And the model shown here in green is a combination of the um, impact on the sun's irradiance of bright faculae. So when the sun is very active or active, see all these bright regions called faculae, they are actually sources of enhanced radiation. So it's like sort of you have a light bulb and if bits of it um, are super bright, then that affects the net output. Or if you have sunspots, and this is a time series of the sunspots, that blocks the radiation. So the total solar radius is literally a balance between the enhancements in regions of bright faculae shown here in the red line and depletions due to sunspots. And it's these, the, all of these wiggles are due to this competition. And just to show you here, they basic the sun's irradiance is in phase. Its variability is in phase with the sunspot number. There was some talk really early on when it was discovered in 1982 that sunspots were causing big dips in the irradiance, that, well, maybe the sun's irradiance was out of phase with this, the solar cycle because, you know, sunspots, sunspots go up, you have more sunspots, decreases the irradiance, but in fact, these other regions, the faculty, the bright regions, they actually win out on our sun. Now, if you look at other stars, uh, younger stars, stars that are younger than the sun, have bigger spots and they actually, their irradiance varies out of phase with their activity and stars that are older than the sun have more faculty. And so our sun is a middle-aged star and it's sort of moving towards a more factually oriented or dominated variability. Now, I want to show you this little figure here because it shows you um, a high time series of the observations and the model in this period here, which is just ramping up to solar cycle 25. And you can see that you can pretty much explain all the wiggles by this competition be between the spots and the faculty. Now, the spots in the faculty, as I'm sure you all know, are features of magnetic activity and they're driven by the sun's dynamo. So the sun, solar activity, produces both spots and faculty. The spots in the faculty have different contrasts at different wavelengths. So this means that the spectrum of the sun varies in different ways at different wavelengths. And this is just showing you from 100 nanometers to 10,000 the faculty contrast and the sunspot contrast. Contrast being a measure of the brightness of faculty. Now, as you go to shorter wavelengths, the emission comes from higher in the sun's atmosphere. It comes from the chromosphere and the, and the corona, and the faculty get very, very bright at the shortest wavelengths. The sunspots get darker, but, but, but only, linear, only like a, you know 30% or so, whereas the faculty get factors of two or more. And so this just shows you that if you want to know the sun's irradiance at a particular wavelength, then you have to know about where that emission comes from in the sun, it, which part of the sun's atmosphere it comes from. And this shows you the sun's atmosphere at solar minimum all the way from the surface, the surface here to the uh, corona, and at solar maximum. And, and in fact, as I mentioned, all of the features, the bright features and the dark features, are a result of the sun's magnetic activity. So our current understanding of how the spectral irradiance changes is shown in this in this slide here. You can see that from the in the extreme ultraviolet, the emissions from the corona 
the energy is much less than at the peak of the black body curve. Now, a proper black body curve would actually keep going down and fall off here. And we have these emissions in the extreme ultraviolet and ultraviolet because they come from the sun's outer atmosphere. So this is the average spectral irradiance. The energy change over the solar cycle peaks in near the visible, but there's a considerable amount in the ultraviolet as well. Um, the relative percentage change you can see maximizes at the shortest wavelengths. So if I, if I look at the emissions from the corona here, they're the most variable, like some of them 100% or more, they um, affect the Earth's thermosphere and ionosphere. If I look at the visible radiation, this varies by maybe a tenth of a percent, and this affects the Earth's troposphere and surface. So what I'm trying to show you here is the mapping of the variability in the spectral irradiance from the sun's atmosphere through to the Earth. Now, um, there are multiple um, um, Earth science endeavors and projects that need to know the sun's irradiance for, in particular, the all of the global change um, climate models and all of the whole Earth atmospheric models uh, need to know what the sun is doing because it's the input but that establishes everything. So with um, the information that I've showed you about the irradiance variations, the magnitude, uh, we have that now operating as an operational product with NOAA. You can actually get it online. It's updated every three months. It's called a climate data record, and, and it gives you the specular radiance and the total solar irradiance every day. So what about the past? Well, the period of the space observations is about the last four solar cycles. And interestingly enough, the space era started at a time when solar activity was quite high. This is, I think, solar cycle 21 or 22. And since then, the solar cycles have been been decreasing in amplitude. But if you go back in time and look at all the sunspot numbers, you can see, even though there is some uncertainty going back in time, that there's a, about a hundred year modulation of the amplitude of the sunspot numbers. So we have a minimum here in the 1900s, another minimum here, I think this is the Dalton minimum. Um, and then the Maunda minimum is this period from 1645 to about 1715, uh, where there were literally hardly any sunspots on the sun. And in fact, seeing a sunspot, I mean, Galileo, I think, started looking at the sun um, in the 1600s and he saw sunspots. And it was so exciting at that time for people to see sunspots that they would write a paper on like, oh, I saw a sunspot, which is like, as George knows, you wouldn't do that now because we see a lot of them. But the the interesting aspect of the Maunder minimum for this period of low solar activity is that, as Jack Eddy pointed out um, 30 or so years ago, it coincides with the coldest part of the Little Ice Age. Now, the Little Ice Age is a period from 1450 to about um, 15, uh, 16, 1700 or so, where winter severity in Europe, in continental Europe, was extremely cold. And before that was a period of um, warmer, warmer, act, uh, warmer temperatures and higher solar activity. So tantalizing correlations like this have, have um, sort of made people wonder for a century or more how the sun might influence the earth. So as a result of that, there's been a sort of cottage industry almost for 30 years trying to estimate how did the sun's total solar irradiance change from the present to the Maunder minimum? In other words, from, from the space era to the Maunder minimum, how much did the irradiance change? I showed you the solar cycle variations in total solar irradiance. The change is about a tenth of a percent, which as Wikipedia says, it's almost constant, but a tenth of a percent change in 1362 watts per meter squared is a lot of energy. So even a small change like that um, can cause changes on Earth. In fact, we are, are the Earth is in this situation where the sun's radiation doesn't change enough to cause big disruptions. I mean, this, the Earth is habitable, but it does change enough to have impacts um, 
if the changes are large enough. So you can see here the estimates of the decrease in um, the sun's irradiance in the more than minimum go anywhere from, this is a solar cycle change, five times the solar cycle to the latest estimates by Yiming Wang and myself recently published in AppJ, where we believe the more than minimum decrease was maybe 20% or so of the solar cycle increase. So the, the way that we do that, and I want to show you here this little movie that shows the sun, the sun rotates um, about every 27 days. And that rotation is differential, which means that it's faster at the equator than at the poles. And this twists up all the magnetic fields and they get all tangled up and some of them erupt to the surface. So the loops like this that have footprints beneath the sun's surface are called closed fields and that's where sunspots and faculae occur then there are other ones i'm going to talk about a little in a few slides coming coming up that are open and they extend out into the heliosphere so Eming wang my colleague at nrl has a model that literally takes um regions on the sun and in fact he he deposits flux on the sun at a rate um typical or represented by the sunspot numbers and then his model rotates those regions on the sun's surface and it counts for the meridional flow of the sun which carries them from the equator where that mainly where the flux emerges to the poles down to the bottom of the uh, convection zone and back again thereby completing the 11 year cycle and it accounts for the diffusion of these species of the of the um flux elements um, which have different polarity so the result of the simulations oops that we made are shown here the green curve is the total is the model simulation of the total magnetic flux from 1700 to the present now remember i said that the total magnetic flux is what generates the faculty and the sunspots and the, the total magnetic flux is um, dominated more by faculae because they're bigger and wider over the sun's surface. But again, it depends on where you are in the solar cycle. And you can see that the total magnetic flux, according to these simulations, has, well, it has a dominant 11-year cycle, but it also has this 100-year cycle, which um, I mentioned before. We, we recently went through what you could call them a modern minimum in the period 2009 to 2010. And that's when, when things that solar activity was very, very low. Um, going back in time, as I mentioned, 1900, 1800, and the morning minimum. Also, in addition to the total flux, which remember I told you is the dominated by closed flux, which are where the loops from the sun um, curve up from the sun and are rooted back um, in the sun's surface. The open flux also has these cycles, and the open flux is the flux that extends out from the sun's surface and interacts with the Earth's magnetosphere. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is because the information that we have about the sun in the past comes from things like cosmogenic isotopes, such as carbon-14, that come from um, particles streaming through the galaxy and interacting with the open flux which um, affects how much of them penetrate to the earth so the this shown here is um, from the carbon 14 production rate and it shows that the gleisberg cycle which is this 100 year cycle has been present um, for more than ten thousand years so when we when we went, when we came through 2009, 2010, there was a lot of talk among solar physicists, among Earth scientists about the sun, the solar activity is so low, it must mean that we're going into a maunder minimum. But you can see, and Joan um, Feynman and um, Alexander Rasmussen pointed out that in fact, this recent minima was a minima in both the 11 year cycle and the Gleisberg cycle. And in fact, and what I'm going to show you in terms of prediction is that it's very likely that the sun is now coming up into another Gleisberg cycle. Um, but you can see here from this, this time series, the Gleisberg cycle itself is not very predictable. 
So this this is I just wanted to put this in here about future solar activity. Is a new Malden minimum evident? Because only 10 years ago, or a little bit over 10 years ago, at the, at the American Astronomical Society meeting, there was a big report that made headlines. This could be the last solar maximum we'll see for a few decades. This was the uh, maximum before 2009. But even as recently as two or three years ago, um, uh, this scientist here who has a dynamo model of the sun predicted a modern, a, a modern grand solar minimum coming up. And so this meant that the climate scientists were like, oh my goodness, the sun's going into a more minimum. Maybe this can offset some of the warming due to the greenhouse gases. Well, it's as I said, it's very unlikely that we're going into a more minimum because um, this is the um, last few cycles of the, the Gleisberg cycle, 1980 down to the present. The flux transport model simulations that I showed you earlier are in pink. And the direct observations from the Wilcox Solar Observatory are in blue. And you can see, yes, indeed, 2010 was very low, but the predictions and, in fact, the observations now coming up onto solar cycle 25 are that solar activity is ramping up. And if we look at the historical data of the carbon-14 in tree rings, Ken McCracken and, and Jörg Beer and colleagues noted that there's a 2,400-year cycle in clusters of minima. So we've just had a Maunda minima and a Spora minima. So we're probably not going to have another Maunda minima for another 2,400 years. But, you know, we'll all be dead by then, so we won't be able to, like, demonstrate or prove that um, prediction. So here is our current understanding of solar irradiance, the total solar irradiance from 1600 to 2100. It's the white curve shown here. This is our latest results. And these are some, the other curves, the, the pink and the blue, are examples of other estimates of the change from the Maunder minimum. The green curve is what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in 2017 estimated the sun's irradiance would be doing based on the, um, what's the word, the, um, the many claims, let's say, by solar people and others that the sun was going into a more than minimum. Now, our predictions here shown in grey are that, no, the sun is not going into a more than minimum, but that, in fact, we're heading for another Gleisberg cycle that may be... We don't really know the magnitude, but here is predicting that it's going to be about comparable to the past Gleisberg cycle. But more interesting than that is the fact that if you look at the total solar irradiance, so I showed you earlier the measurements from um, 1980 and the measurements here that I showed you are in green. The blue curve is the model of the reconstruction based on the flux transport model. The, both the model and the observations in the current solar cycle. Now, we're almost at the peak, I think, or we're heading to the, the peak of, the current, of this present solar cycle. But the total solar radius is as high as it's ever been annually in the past. In other words, the total solar radius is shooting right up in this new cycle. If we look at the faculty and the spots, remember I said that the total solar irradiance is the balance between the, the bright faculty that cause the irradiance to increase and the dark sunspots that cause it to decrease. Shown here are the sunspots. Now, I, I should have mentioned that this, this white curve is simply, or, and the yellow curve, are, are statistical representations of an 11 year cycle of varying periods, in this case, 10.8 years, modulated by the Gleisberg cycle. So it's simply a statistical representation of the past. But if you compare with observations, the sunspots are more or less not ramping up very much at all. They're more or less the same at the peak of this current cycle as they were last cycle, but the faculty are zooming right up. So this then leads to the question, of why does the sun's magnetic activity produce faculty versus sunspots? Like what causes the partitioning? And this is a new area of understanding um, that we need to have in order to 
forecast or project solar irradiance. And so I think in this current solar cycle, we're really going to start learning a lot about the balance between the factory and the sunspots. And it could be that as we moved into a new Gleisberg cycle, the sun actually um, is not going to produce the sunspots and factory in the same proportion as it did in the last one. But we're going to have to wait and see for that. So that that's the, that's my sort of um, synopsis of the solar irradiance and its variability. So now I want to talk about how those variations uh, affect us on Earth. And all of the regions of Earth that, well, we live in the troposphere at the surface. We rely on the stratosphere. Uh, because of its ozone layer to protect us. So remember um, in the 1980s, there was a big scare about the ozone. It wasn't a scare, it was the truth of ozone depletion. And then we utilise the thermosphere and ionosphere extensively for orbiting spacecraft. All of these regions are undergoing anthropogenic change. Uh, we know about like anthropogenic gases, which are in increases in gases like CO2 that trap, um, they're emitted into the atmosphere and they trap the outgoing um, infrared radiation from the earth and the, that is warmed by the sun. In fact, you could say that if we didn't have the sun, we wouldn't even have global warming because we wouldn't have the sun to heat the earth and then produce the infrared radiation that the greenhouse gases trap. There's a long history of climate deniers saying that it, the reason for the increase in surface temperature, which I'm going to show you in a minute, is due to the sun and literally sowing doubt about um, the effect of climate change. So I'm going to show you our current understanding of climate change in terms of solar and greenhouse gases and other things. Moving up into the stratosphere, I'm going to show you um, some the ozone record and ozone depletion. Um, the ozone depletion from 1980 to about um, maybe two or three decades after that was due to chlorofluorocarbon increases. Um, chlorofluorocarbons are gases that are released in um, things like refrigerants. Um, they're inert in the troposphere, in the lower atmosphere, which is why they're really good, but they drift up into the stratosphere and there the sun's ultraviolet radiation has enough energy to dissociate them this produces chlorofluorocarbons that destroy ozone but at the same time the co2 increasing causes cooling in the stratosphere and that's because the co2 gases although they um they trap the radiation from the surface by the time they reach the stratosphere there's really no overlying atmosphere and so they cool the stratosphere so ozone depletion and that issue involves solar variability, CFCs and greenhouse gases. If we move up into the space environment, here we, we know the solar increase, which is an increase in the ultraviolet, extreme ultraviolet radiation, warms the thermosphere by a large amount. In fact, you can see here, um, the solar cycle adds like a factor of two or more onto that. But the CO2 actually cools the thermosphere. So we, you might think of greenhouse gases like CO2 as only being relevant for the Earth's surface where they cause warming. But that's not the case because, oops, they um, cause cooling in the upper atmosphere. Now, I want to show you um, each of those different layers and how the sun, um, the, the contribution of the sun to changes in these layers relative to the anthropogenic gases. So this is a record of the global surface temperature from 1850, which is sort of thought of as the pre-industrial period, to the present. These temperatures have been de-seasonalized. If, if, if they had the annual cycle in here, then that would be a really large cycle. So when we talk about global change, we talk about change in the temperature after the annual cycle has been removed. But you can see that from 1970 onwards, all of these different measurements and I'm showing these different measurements because, you know, there's an argument amongst climate deniers that, well, the records don't agree, and one of them says this, but they don't. These are the latest um, releases by four different um, organisations. They all show that the Earth's surface temperature has warmed from the pre-industrial pre period 
And now in the most recent um, year, it's as much as 1.5 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial. This is an important number, and I'm going to explain why, but it's related to the concept that anything warming below 1.5 degrees centigrade is reversible or we can handle that. But once you go above 1.5, then the changes become perhaps, and we don't know because we haven't been there, be perhaps too hard to be easily reversed. You can see here that the warming is spatially dependent. So not only is it non-uniform temporally, but also spatially. So for example, from 1900 to 1950 or so, the warming was in different, slightly different places. Um, most recently, it's been uh, in the Northern Hemisphere land masses. Now this warming in the last um, 150 years, shown here in perspective for the last um, 1,000 years, it's been two or three times more rapid than the decrease and larger than the decrease over the over the previous um, 800 years. And that decrease over the past 800 years is part of um, the general cycle um, of the Holocene and the interglacial epoch. In other words, on timescales of um, 40,000 years, 20,000 years, and 100,000 years, the Earth naturally goes through changes in temperature because of the orbit and eccentricity and precision of its um, orbit about the sun. So agriculture started about 10,000 years ago at the current interglacial epoch. Before that were um, the ice ages and the younger dryers. And you can see here the most recent 150 years warming exceeds the temperature in the last maximum of the last interglacial epoch and the rate of change is much greater so there is as far as i can see and as far as climate scientists say no doubt that um this is not these are not natural causes and so let's look at what are the causes of the global surface temperature change in the last um 100 years or so the white curve are the observations that I showed you previously. The orange curve is a model that explains a good fraction of those observations. And it includes variability due to the El Nino Southern Oscillation. You've probably heard a lot about that recently because in, in the maybe the past year or so, we had a strong El Nino event. When there's an El Nino event, that is a positive phase of the El Nino Southern Oscillation, and it can warm the global temperature by a few tenths of a degree. When we have a volcanic eruption like um, El Chichon and Pinatubo, this is Pinatubo, um, that cools the Earth's global surface temperature by a few tenths of a degree. This is the effect of the sun's total solar irradiance, and you can see that the solar cycle produces of order a tenth of a degree. So we're talking about an increase of 1.5 degrees centigrade in the global surface temperature of the Earth, of which the sun produces a cyclic modulation of about a tenth of a degree. So there is, in, with our current understanding of solar variability and irradiance, we cannot explain this um, warming by the sun, but we can explain, as I'll show you in a minute, ups and downs. So the anthropogenic influence shown here, which is the net effect of increasing greenhouse gases, um, which warm the planet and then um, are corrected for a cooling due to aerosols, which are the result of industrial emissions, it accounts for 80% of the warming. And in fact, each of these different influences, the El Nino Southern Oscillation shown here, this is uh, and the volcanic and the sun and the greenhouse gases, they all have different um, spatial representations. In other words, they all warm the planet in different ways because of the different mechanisms. So the El Nino, as you, I'm sure you all know, is a warming in the um, Pacific Ocean. Um, volcanic cooling tends to be at northern high latitudes. This is a map, or this, this shows you the um, where the sun has most influence. You would, you would you, you could have thought that, well, why is the sun's influence at 
higher latitudes that are not at the equator. That's because of the, the dynamic effects that I showed you earlier transport the heat from the sun at the equator to the tropical to the mid latitudes. And this is the global um, the greenhouse gas or the anthropogenic warming much more uniformly spread. Now you can see that all those different influences combine to let us reproduce in actually quite high fidelity the observed temperature records. Now, if you if you make the mistake of thinking that only greenhouse gases are the only thing causing climate change, you can get yourself into a lot of trouble. <laughs> and this is what happened with IPCC in 2013. IPCC ran a whole lot of its models, which are shown here in blue, and they all said the next um, 50 years we expect the climate to warm. We expect the global surface temperature to keep increasing. Now, interestingly, at the time that they produced this report, in fact, there had been probably a decade or more where the, the Earth's surface temperature had not increased. And so the IPCC invoked a global warming hiatus. It said, well, we don't know why, but for some reason, global warming stopped, right? They, they said global warming hiatus because the actual observations of the Earth's global surface temperature didn't match the models. This caused an enormous, I mean, this was only um, 10 years ago, and it caused a decade of um, scientific, political, social, and economic confusion. And here's some examples of that. Nature, nature had an, an article that said climate change, the case of the missing heat. And so this sent off scientists climate scientists in all manner of investigations. And there were subsequent reports saying, no, well, the heat was hiding in the oceans. Oh, no, we found the heat in the Pacific Ocean. Some people said that um, this lack of warming was caused by aerosols from China's coal burning. Some people said that it was background aerosols resulting left over from Pinatubo um, in 1992. Some people mentioned anomalously solar irradiance, but the gist of it all, and you can probably remember this, the big debates about um, the fact that there was no warming for 16 years and, and what does this mean about global warming? In fact, I like this little cartoon here. It says, is global warming real? And here's a scientist saying, well, yeah, just ask the global warming fairies. This this whole episode, in fact, I wrote a paper about this whole episode um, in um, Wiley Reviews of Climate Change. It casts great doubt on the science of climate change and on the scientists. And it even led to um, the, the various right-wing think tanks saying, well, if there's a hi hiatus in global warming, then why, why do we have this big shift to green to green energy. So you can see it's really important to know why the um, global temperature is changing. And why did it change in that period? Here is the blow up or high time resolution of the period called the hiatus from about 2000 to about 2012. You can see it's bracketed by El, El, an El Nino event at one end and at the other. It's bracketed by a decrease in the sun's solar cycle causing cooling. And basically the net effect of, of a La Nina phase of the, of the El Nino Southern Oscillation combined with cooling by the sun's irradiance cancelled the greenhouse warming over that time. And so eventually <laughs> Mother Jones had an article who created the global warming pause and pointed out if all explanations were correct, the pause would now be explained twice over. So the reason, oh, here's the, and this is the reference for um, the article I wrote on this. When I first submitted the paper, basically saying IPCC made a big mistake, the editor said, well, we want to publish your paper, but I think you need to reduce the diatribe against IPCC. Because basically the claim by IPCC that we had this global warming hiatus led us astray for 10 years. And this is a really, I mean, we need to understand global climate change. So the reason I'm telling you this little story is because we need to know what the sun is doing and what it isn't doing. So this is also true in the stratosphere, but 
it's not as controversial in the stratosphere because the effects of the sun on the stratosphere temperature and the ozone layer are more obvious. So when we look at the temperature 20 kilometers, so this is just above the um, trop troposphere, in other words, the lowest stratosphere, you can see here the temperature, the global surface temperature is now decreasing. And in fact, during this period of uh, the pause that I told you about where the global surface temperature didn't increase, um, people were saying, well, look, the temperature at 20 kilometers, it's cooling. So how can we have greenhouse warming if the temperature at 20 kilometers is cooling? Well, the reason it's cooling at 20 kilometers is, as I mentioned before, because greenhouse gases cause cooling at 20 kilometers because there's no overlaying atmosphere to trap the radiation. And so even 20 kilometers above the surface, we have a different mix of the El Nino Southern Oscillation, volcanoes which produce warming. We have the anthropogenic cooling due to greenhouse gases, but we also have um, another anthropogenic effect due to chlorofluorocarbons. This is called the effective equivalent stratospheric chloro. And you can see what's happening at 20 kilometers is these two anthropogenic effects are now op operating in different directions because the Montreal Protocol um, caused a decrease in the, or eliminated the use of it, uh, the fluorocarbons. And so that effect started, um, let the ozone recover, but the anthropogenic effect caused it to decrease. So um, in terms of total ozone, the ozone decreased uh, according to the Montreal Protocol, but it hasn't come back to the level of uh, 1980 because we have a greenhouse gas effect also on ozone. And that's because the surface heating due to the greenhouse gases affects the dynamical um, interactions of the troposphere with the brewer dobson circulation, which affects ozone. So you can see how complicated this um, is once you start to look at um, why is ozone changing? Why is the temperature of 20 kilometers changing? And here what you can see is now the solar effect is bigger. Um, it's very detectable and it's equivalent essentially, or maybe even larger than the net effect of the anthropogenic effects. Now, moving up to the thermosphere and ionosphere here, the sun's radiation, um, it's electromagnetic radiation, literally dominates the whole environment. And as you go from solar max to solar min, there's an order of magnitude or more increase in neutral density, uh, electron density, and the temperature increases by a factor of two. So what I'm showing you here is the density derived from spacecraft drag by another colleague at the Naval Research Lab at 275 kilometers. You can see the dominant 11 year cycle. Um, this is the model, uh, a model of the observations which is shown in, right, white, in white. And if you break down that model into components, the dominant um, cause of the variability is the solar irradiance. So there's a geomagnetic activity effect, which as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, um, involves particles and uh, magnetic fields interacting with the Earth's um, magnetosphere. There's a semi-annual and annual oscillation, and this is the CO2 cooling here. Now, the density is crucial for how we operate um, assets in low Earth orbit, and in particular, the International Space Station is the 400 kilometers. The, every time there's um, the possibility of a collision of the space station with another orbiting object, then it, it does a course correction to get out of the way, basically, of the debris or the other object. And um, since 2020 alone, the, um, there have been three such times that the um, space station has had to uh, maneuver. And I wanna show you how in this curve, how the, the EUV irradiance directly affects the density. And this is the density at Yoko, which is a satellite that in fact, George was a PI of an experiment that looked at the sun. Yoko did not have onboard propulsion. And so as its altitude stayed more or less the same during this period of solar, low solar activity, but as solar activity ramped up, poor old Yoko basically re-entered. And you can see here, even on, on the day-to-day -day changes with the sun's rotation, the 27-day rotation, the density in the thermosphere 
varies in phase with the sun's irradiance and this affects the um, conditions or the environment of orbiting objects. So I know um, I, we're getting near um, nine o'clock. So the last few slides, I want to show you building on what we know about how the sun's irradiance changes, including the future. What I've told you about how the earth from the surface to the stratosphere and the um, space environment change in response to that. What about the future? So I mentioned that um, 1.5 degree warming, which we have now hit, this is a blow up, um, a, a high temp time resolution of the white of the observed global surface temperature records. And this is the 1.5 degree um, warming above pre-industrial. World leaders promise to limit the temperature to 1.5 degrees. And the reason that, that this is important, which is explained here, every tenth of a degree of warming matters, but as you get warmer, each increment matters more. So the warmer you get, the more likely you are to have what are called climate, climate tipping points. So for example, you've probably heard of that in terms of the um, ice melting. The ice doesn't melt linearly with temperature. In fact, a number of things um, cause it to melt, including things like the reduction in friction between say an iceberg and the land on which it sits. And it can be very non-linear with temperature. And if the climate reaches tipping points, then it's much harder to go back. And so the, this here shows you if we keep going a business as usual scenario, by 2050, we will have reached two degrees warming above pre-industrial. The only, well, the IPCC um, conducted scenarios of what we would need to do to stabilize the global surface temperature at two degrees above the pre-industrial level. If we keep going with the anthropogenic emissions um, business as usual, like the same rate that we're using them now, the two, the two will reach two degrees by 2050, but it, by, but it will by, be by no means stabilized. In order to stabilize the temperature, at two degrees, we have to start cutting the emissions now and an IPCC produced some scenarios to do that. So let's say we actually, and I don't believe this is going to happen. I don't believe, and I, the climate scientists that I speak with and know don't believe it's going to ha happen either. We would have to start now with drastic cuts in greenhouse gases in order to stabilize the global surface temperature warming to two degrees C. Now, if we did that, then what would happen, this is a scenario from 2050 to 2070, which shows you where, where the, the temperature eventually is stabilised at under two degrees. The anthropogenic gases have to de decrease enormously. And what that means is now the natural variability due to the sun and ENSO becomes more dominant. So in order to know that we actually have stabilised the climate, if we ever get to do that, we're going to know what the sun is doing because we have to know what the sun is doing because if we don't, then we'll think that an, a high increase in solar activity, a whole, you know, a nice active 11 year cycle is producing warming or the descending phase is producing cooling. And this will, um, we need to know this for the proper attribution of what the greenhouse gases are doing. This is also true for the ozone and for atmospheric temperature. So you can see the sun is playing, likely to play an even more important role in the future, simply because we need to know what it's doing in order to achieve proper attribution of what is causing the um, environment to change. Okay, so this is, I promise, getting to be my last slide. And I wanna bring this up because it's really, really important. Um, and that it relates to the fact that there are more and more and many, many more objects being launched into low Earth, Earth orbit. Um, we have these mega constellation things like Starlink, multiple, um, multiple spacecraft. And every country basically on the planet has filed notice with the International Telecommunication Union that they expect to launch their own mega constellation. And it's not clear that any of this will happen. And this um, little graphic here shows you these orb all these orbiting spacecraft. 
Now, the collision rate of spacecraft, remember I showed you, I, mean, I explained that the space station had to maneuver because of the threat of collision. The collision rate grows as a square of the number of satellites. So if we start launching, well, we have started launching more satellites into orbit, we're going to have increased um, rate of collision. And the collision probability, in order to compute that, you need to know the density. So we need to know what the density is doing in the future. Therefore, we need to know what the sun is doing in the future. And there's this scenario, the Kessler syndrome, which says that as the dens density of space rubbish increases, there could be a cascading, self-sustaining runaway cycle of debris generation. In other words, you get so much to debris in low Earth orbit that they can't avoid colliding. And this then propagates so that there are more collisions and more debris. Okay, so in fact, we have launched, this is the number of launches, satellite launches. There was um, a factor of five or six more launches in 2020 than in any of the previous years. Now, 2020 was a period of low solar activity. It's this period here. So all of Elon Musk's Starlink satellites have been launched into a period of low solar activity. And you've probably heard how some of them actually um, deorbited. But going forward, we are going to have many, many more satellites launched. And if we are right that the sun is going into a new Gleisberg cycle, those satellites are going to encounter higher solar activity and higher densities than they have ever encountered in the past couple of decades when uh, the most of the satellites are launched. And this little figure just shows you here a couple of collisions, how um, the Chinese did an anti-satellite test. It um, causes a rapid increase in the number of objects orbiting whenever there's a collision. And this was, this was another indication here. So going forward, there will be cooling of the upper atmosphere, but it's not going to compensate the increase by a, a new Gleitzberg cycle. So I want to bring this up because the space environment is yet another part of our environment that we have to take care of and know what the natural variations are due to as well as the anthropogenic. Okay, I finished. This is my summary. Solar irradiance changes on all time scales. And I mentioned about the magnetic flux. Um, it's really going to be interesting in the next um, solar cycle to know, to see if we can understand why the magnetic flux produces sunspots versus faculty. It's also going to be interesting to see if we really are entering a new Gleisberg cycle. I think we are, because this current cycle is really ramping up. But then how big, I mean, we won't know till 2016, I'll be dead by then, um, but it would be really great to come back and see what happened to the Gleisberg cycle. Um, in terms of um, the modulation of the solar irradiance by the Earth's surface temperature, atmosphere and ozone, ozone, the big outstanding question for our environment is when and at what temperature will global, global surface temperature stabilise and will the ozone densities ever recover? We need to know what the sun is doing in order to be able to detect if that actually happens. And in terms of the um, space, our societal infrastructure depends on space. So if there's a Kessler effect, which could be exacerbated by the increasing density in the upcoming few decades due to the increasing solar activity, then this could, we don't know, but it might exacerbate or it might diminish the Kessler effect. We simply don't know. Um, and a practical question um, for monitoring the sun and the earth, all of the databases that I've showed you, the time series, have all come from continuous monitoring of the sun and the earth. Will the operational solar irradiance monitoring continue with the need of precision? If not, how will we identify the causes of the environment and the stabilisation? Okay, I finished. Thank you. So I just think I do escape, do I? Uh, yes, thank you very much. That okay. was great. We really appreciate that. You can do stop sharing, okay, you, and that will stop it. And, okay, go, hang on. Stop. Right there. Um, yep. Present. Okay. Stop presenting. Got it. Yep. Right. <laughs> okay. So now question time, or else you it's questions. 
Paul actually said if I went too long, I wouldn't have any questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, great presentation. <laughs> I can't hear any questions. <laughs> so, Paul, there were a couple of hands raised. Oh, I'm. Hi, George. <laughs> yeah, I did. Are there, model, are there models that predict uh, the areas of sunspots and the areas in the surrounding faculty? Because apparently the ratio of faculty to sunspot area is a critical factor. In all. I know. I don't know. There's been. Um, there have been a number of people who do, who observationally compare things like the faculty and the sunspots from Greenwich, um, but no, I don't know. You you would know more than I do. I, that's a real solar physics question, and I don't think that um, people necessarily appreciate it. That they might be as de decoupled from each other as they are because everyone thinks well the sun. Solar activity goes up, sunspots go up, the faculty go up. Yeah, maybe but by different amounts. But I don't know who who could predict the partitioning of the faculty and the spots. Yeah. Do you? You should, I mean, this is. <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> I think it's a fascinating question. For for amateurs looking at the sun, visually the faculty are easiest to see at the limb. That's because yes. of solar so limb, limb darkening uh, when they move on to the center of the disc they're harder to see but uh, you can see them in the chromosphere you can see them as yeah. plants like yeah. in, as you go a little bit higher yeah. well you can go to the gong site and get all these h alpha images of the sun see them easily yeah right in fact i started mm -hmm. working with the 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 model that i showed you the sunspot component of the irradiance is yeah. is from the gong white light images yeah. extracting the yeah. sunspots and the gong have magnetograms coincident with the white light images so i'm hoping to be able to extract the mm -hmm. faculty from the magnetograms by identifying where the sunspots are then mm -hmm. the, the the remaining will be faculty but yeah it's really yeah you better right. come, come out i was to work on this <laughs> guy brandenburg has a question yeah well just well an observation and a question I was just out at Great Falls with some other folks looking at the sun and yeah. including a hydrogen alpha filter. Yeah. It just seemed to me that the, the bright parts, uh, which, as somebody said, you can see easier on the limb than in the very center. But the sun was very active today, and the atmosphere was great. But I would say that the area of faculi is, is like, many times the size of the... Uh, um, sunspots but that's just one person's biased opinion no no yeah absolutely right they do the faculty cover a much larger area than the spots but they're more dispersed and an individual faculty in the visible radiation is is like maybe a few percent contrast but the sunspots are maybe 30 percent darker but that oh. changes as you go to different wavelengths but yeah no you're absolutely right and that, then i had a question i was sort of wondering what is the energy budget of uh, let's say you've got a square mile of solar panels in a let's say uh a desert that has a lot a lot of sunlight i'm pretty sure i don't know the answer to this but keep going <laughs> oh, well, i don't know the know the answer i was going to ask you know does it make the whole area warmer or co cooler or what i don't know <laughs> okay all right I'm sorry you would have to do a radiative balance calculation of like okay so we know on the big picture that um for example the ice reflects back radiation and um, basically you will be changing the earth's albedo because you're putting a different surface there than what's normally there um but whether it would affect the albedo globally i don't know i was just more thinking locally i know but local things can add up like yeah. the whole the whole idea of the melting ice is a, a, a local thing because it's the, the poles but it adds up to changing the albedo and the same like the whole land use issue the deforestation the use of land land use is um a component of anthropogenic change so what you're saying i think is really true um but solar panels are just one other form of industrialization i mean we have 
cities that are heat islands because of the land use change, you know, the land use change. There aren't any trees and things like that. So, but yeah, I don't know the energy budget for what you're talking about. Sorry. Okay. Thanks. Zach, you have a question? I do, yeah. Um, <clears throat> early on in your presentation, you had a couple of slides that compared um, the faculty uh, occurrence with sunspot occurrence. And it looked to me like one of them, uh, in one of them in, in recent decades, the number of these things were sort of converging around whatever the center axis was. Sorry, it would help if I could see it again, but. <laughs> Do you want me to put it? What? Which you want the images of the faculty in the spots? Is that uh, what you want? There was a graph that had um, uh, lines about occurrences of these things. It might have been in the third or fourth slide or so. Can I do? Should I do share screen again? Uh, sure, if you like. You still have PowerPoint running? Yes. Okay. Of course, so do. here we go. Um, I think this is this the one you were talking about. Oh, hang on, I got to back out of full screen. <laughs> I know it's hard with all the buttons, isn't it? Yep. Let me see if I can get it. This one. That one, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This one. Yes. Yeah. So the the middle graph there. Yeah. Uh, it 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 looks like like on either side of of the zero line those. Uh, the occurrences are, are are sort of getting smaller, so I'm wondering what that is, what that is representing. Uh, Say that again. Does that question right, makes I, sense. No, <laughs> sorry. Okay. On the so, here's the zero line, right? On either yeah. side of the zero line, you. Yeah. So. so I think instance, what Zach is saying is, if you compare the maximum amplitude in the 1980s. With the maximum amplitude in the 2015s, you see how it's gradually decreasing. Right, that and that's the overlying Gleisberg cycle. Ah, okay, okay, yep. You see Thank what you. I'm saying? Yeah. So if you go back, if you go, keep going back, then like the previous cycles, except for cycle 20, were larger. This this decreasing here. See this period. This was um, what I talked about as the very low minima in the 11 year cycle, the Schwabe cycle, and in the Gleisberg cycle. So this envelope, all of the space era measurements have been in the descending phase of the Gleisberg cycle. Look, you can see it here in sunspots as well. See, that's the amplitude of the Schwabe cycle, the 11 year cycle, I mean, decreasing due to the Gleisberg cycle. Okay. Does that make, is, is that okay? It does, yeah. Yeah, it, it makes sense now. Uh, I think, because yes. that's why I'm forecasting. See, here we are in the current cycle. That's why I'm forecasting that these amplitudes are going to start increasing again as we get come in we, into the next Gleisberg cycle. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, good. You're welcome. Oh, now <laughs> I'm going to navigate my way back here. I've got to stop. <sighs> stop sharing. Okay. Done. Thank you, Paul. Your your tutorial worked, hey? Okay. I didn't Paul screw Robert. it up. <laughs> Any more questions? Oh, Judith, we oh George. Yeah. I've got a, a spectroscopy question. Um in the in the atmosphere, CO2 and methane and all these things in water vapor all have absorption bands. Right. And this molecular thing, it's complicated. How well are these um molecules known how, how good is the spectroscopy the atomic uh, yeah, physics behind it yeah i couldn't and, tell you sorry and i wonder does the, the doppler effect in any way if you're moving if you have um, clouds moving and stuff like that that have a co2 in them there'll be there could be a doppler shift between absorption features in the co2 and methane so that the infrared gets out and doesn't get absorbed and vice versa so I, I just wonder uh, what those effects are. I, mean, I think they were considered in the past, but people who looked at this, they must be in the models. Doesn't matter what I, I mean. Not, sorry. Because right, <laughs> because you, yes. <laughs> your models calculate how much absorption is in the greenhouse effect, and that depends on the molecular structure of CO2 and methane and all the absorbers. Right. right. Yep. Okay. Sorry. Uh, Mike, do you, you have a question? Mike, you're on. Yeah, I do. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Looks like you can. 
Uh, I'm just curious. There was a unit of measure. It looked like uh, W M to the raised to the minus two. Was power. yeah, was per meter squared. That's what I thought. Thank you. Yeah, yeah that's the that's the unit. Sorry, I should have explained that. That's the unit of irradiance. How many watts per meter squared reaches one astronomical unit? Irradiance is measured at a fixed distance, but in fact, the received radiation, which is what actually reaches the Earth, has the annual cycle in it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. I think that's, I don't see any more questions. Okay. Well, thank you for letting me um, give you my spiel about solar variability and the earth. <laughs> it's, it's very interesting. We appreciate your time and, and certainly appreciate your insight in, in a complicated area. And um, it is. And, the, and like, it's unfortunately, one of those things where I guess we'll find out who's right in time or <laughs> understanding no, we go forward. I, I'm not sure that's the exact way to put it. We'll find out the consequences of the. Yeah, well, it's. it's, it's effects. It, 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 like you Actually, said, we'll be uh, dead by the, the time the real right. effects happen. There's a lot of factors. But, uh, but no, but it's, it's good to understand how people come to the conclusions they come to and, and how it all fits, fits together. And we really appreciate your time and, and thank you for, for being with us tonight. And come see us sometime at George Mason where we can all talk to you in person. I'm glad you're interested in the sun as a star. <laughs> always. Yes, always. Okay. Okay. Well, bye thank you all. Bye, everyone. Bye, George. <laughs> Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. So with that, we'll adjourn for the night. So thank you all very much. Have a good evening.